with God's people both in the Old Testament and also in the New Testament. How often we fail to walk by faith and thus resist the Spirit of God. How often we walk in the flesh and resist the Spirit of God. How often we know the will of God and choose not to do the will of God after the Spirit of God has illuminated the Scriptures to us. The Scriptures are already inspired by the Spirit of God. And it is the Spirit of God who illuminates the Scripture to us. And as he does so, we are held accountable. And when we choose not to obey what the Word of God says, we are in fact resisting the Holy Ghost. We'll see as we look at our text for tonight that this was historically true of people in the Old Testament. And we discover that sadly it is also true of even believers in the church today. There are great penalties for those who resist the Holy Ghost. There are great losses of rewards. There is great chastening for those who, knowing the truth, choose not to believe it based on their own experiences, based on their own will, their self-will, based on their own desires, based on their own preconceived theology instead of based on the Word of God. Resisting the Holy Ghost. We're in Acts chapter 7 tonight, verses 51 through 53. Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost, as your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them, which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers. Strong words. Who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. Gracious Heavenly Father, we pray for your blessings upon the going forth of your word tonight. We pray that we might not resist the Holy Ghost, the one who has inspired the scripture, the one who now by your Holy Spirit illumines the scripture, the one who convicts us of sin and draws us to repentance, the one who would have us to hear and not to be stiff-necked in our ears, the one who would reach into our hardened hearts and cause us to obey. Father, we pray that you will bless your word as it goes forth tonight to reach every person here. Not just a few, not one or two, but every one of us, that we might understand who the Holy Spirit is and the work that he is performing in our midst. Bless your word, Father, for it is your word and it is supernatural 
And we pray that the Holy Spirit will use it in our hearts tonight. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> now you recall last week we were looking at temples made with hands. And Stephen has moved from the discussion of the tabernacle to discussing the temple which replaced the tabernacle in its permanent location on Mount Zion in the city of Jerusalem. Mount Moriah, that place where now the blasphemous and demonic Dome of the Rock now stands. A Muslim stronghold, a satanic stronghold, whereby Jews and Christians are not allowed to come and hold services or pray upon the Holy Mount. It's currently in Satan's hand, but the day is coming, and coming soon when it will no longer be in the hands of Satan, but it will be in the hands of Jesus Christ himself. I do hope that you will be able to come this week to the Adult Summer Bible School. Not only are we going to see the mar marvelous and magnificent ways in which God has reestablished the nation of Israel and protected her through all of her wars, but we're also going to see the prophetic promises for the city of Jerusalem and in particular for the Temple Mount and for the grand and glorious temple that Christ himself will build. Oh, there will be an intervening pseudo-temple built by the Antichrist. There are those who will be deceived into thinking among the Jews that the Antichrist is their Messiah. He will help them to build another temple there on the Temple Mount. In fact, today, as I mentioned this morning, there are, there are Jews who have actually prepared all the necessary instruments that were described in the Old Testament for the work and the service of the temple. The Temple Institute, the treasures of the temple, they have provided all of those. There are rabbis in Jerusalem, old rabbis, who believe that they know precisely where the Ark of the Covenant is hidden under the Temple Mount. They are in a search for the ashes of the red heifer to be able to purify all of the vessels. You will hear if you come. Actually, interviews with some of these men who have now died and you will go underneath, which you can no longer do via the film, you will go underneath areas of the Temple Mount, which now the Muslims have closed off. Don't miss it. God has made promises to Israel concerning a future millennial temple in the book of Ezekiel, when Jesus Christ comes to reign here on earth. And so as we see Stephen's discussion here, we're not only moving from the the tabernacle in the Old Testament, to the first temple and then to the second temple period, which goes all the way back to the return of the Jews in the days of Ezra, Nehemiah, and Zerubbabel, and all the way down to the days of Herod, who enlarged that second temple, and then it was destroyed, but we are also looking into the future. We're looking toward a time when there will be, as prophesied in the Old Testament, a temple that the Antichrist builds and where he sets himself up as God three and a half years through the tribulation period. And then into the future when there will be the reestablishment of the temple and its sacrifices as a memorial just as we have the Lord's table looking back to the finished sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we have moved last week into temples made with hands. Solomon built him in house, albeit the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands, as saith the prophet. Heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. What house will ye build me, saith the Lord, or what is my place of rest? Hath not my hands made all of these things? As we saw in moving from the tabernacle into the temple, God's next dwelling place, he is now closing his argument to prove that the Jewish leaders are the guilty party and he is not the guilty party, though they have put him on trial. His closing argument now points the finger of guilt to the very Sanhedrin, which has thought that they might judge him as they did with the Messiah himself. His argument, however, is not before a court on earth. As we're going to see in the next few verses, his argument is before the court of heaven because as he closes his argument, he sees the Lord Jesus Christ on the right hand of the Father. Here is the true judge, the one who will judge all the earth. As Jesus said, 
All judgment is committed unto the Son. Stephen is making his closing arguments before the judge whom he knows is the righteous judge. And the human judges will rush upon him, stopping their ears and screaming they do not want to hear it, and drag him out of the city and stone him to death. The temple was a sensitive issue, as we noted, with the Jews. Jesus had pressed that issue. But the Jews' love for their stone temple was a serious point of contention with the Lord Jesus Christ. Just like the Sabbath was a serious point of contention, it still is a point of contention among those who are Sabbatarians today. Your people, be careful because Jesus Christ is teaching something as you move through the Gospels, moving from a temple of stone to a temple of flesh, moving from the law to grace, moving from the Sabbath to the first day of the week. Nowhere in the New Testament is Sunday called the Sabbath. Those are things that are difficult for some to hear. But what we are doing is we are moving now and Stephen is stoned to death for the very fact that he challenges that movement, which begins on the day of Pentecost. You've got to come to the summer adult Bible school class looking at the archaeological investigations of the temple and the preparations for rebuilding the temple, which will be, in fact, the temple of the Antichrist, because only Messiah can build his temple on the Temple Mount. I personally believe that the temple of the Antichrist whereby he will be able to pull together Jews and Muslims and Roman Catholics and others who are left behind, will be not on the site where the Dome of the Rock is, but the Antichrist will build his temple off to the site which is known as the Dome of the Spirit. Oh, you've got to come and hear the archaeological evidence, please, this week. We saw that the first mention of the temple is in Christ's temptation by the devil. He mentions it again in arguing against the Sabbath tradition of the Jews. He clearly uh, claimed his personally to be greater than the temple itself. He claimed his personal authority over the temple and its grounds. He performed messianic signs and miracles in the temple, authenticating his messianic claims. It was the temple that Christ accepted the messianic praise offered by children. It was in the temple that Jesus taught, and it was there that the priest challenged his authority. Jesus condemned the Jewish leaders for misapplying the sacred significance and purpose of the temple. Even the disciples on the night of the Olivet Discourse, prophetic future events for Israel in Matthew chapter 24, had still missed the point of the temporary nature of the temple of stone. It was over the issue of the temple that Christ was condemned to be crucified. <clears throat> Remember that was the final arguments where they found two witnesses who said, this fellow said, I'm able to destroy the temple of God and build it in three days. We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands and within three days I will build another made with hands. It was in the temple that Christ destroyed the arguments of the Jews as to why he could not be the Messiah. The temple was the subject of the final prophecy concerning national Israel that Jesus gave before his crucifixion. Is the temple important in the life of Christ as we go through the Gospels? Yes, it is. He's telling them something else is coming. And then one of the passages that I accidentally skipped last week and realized that after the message was over, the issue of the temple was the primary point of mocking Christ on the cross. Matthew 27 and Mark 15. Matthew 27, 40, first of all, in saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself if thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. It was something that stuck in their craw. It was something they couldn't tolerate. Jesus speaking against the temple. Okay, you think you can destroy the temple and build it again? Okay, fine, go ahead. Come on down from the cross and do it. Let's see you do it. Cast it in his teeth. The background then for Stephen's sermon was clearly the Jews were not very happy with the way Christ and his followers were treating their sacred building. But on the day of Pentecost, God changed his temple from a temple of stone and his stony law began to be written on the tables of the flesh of heart. The old covenant, the old place of worship, was fading away. 
God's decision was to move to a new temple. The temple of the body of believers. That's one of the primary teaching points on the day of Pentecost. And it was an intolerable blasphemy from the Jewish point of view. The proof that God gave of this point that he was making, that he was moving from one temple to another, the proof of that point was the visible Shekinah glory resting on the new temples as it had rested on the old temples of stone. God's proof of this was the speaking of 18 foreign languages by ignorant men who had never studied those languages. Don't miss those points in Acts 2. It's a critical hinge point in the history of the world. It's the reason that we are here tonight. As God has moved to a new temple. And if you are a believer, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit of God. The point of Acts 2 is not to say that we must all speak in tongues. That's nonsense. That's charismatic idiocy. Only the apostles spoke in tongues on the day of Pentecost. We saw that when we studied Acts chapter 2. The point is, God has switched temples and a new work of the Spirit is beginning in Acts 2. And Stephen is making reference back to that here in his sermon in Acts chapter 7. And they can't tolerate it. No, no, God is reserved to us, the Jews, alone. Don't even talk about moving to new temples. Those are movable temples. Those are temples that can go to other places. And we see that's precisely what God does in the book of Acts. The gospel begins to spread from Jerusalem to Judea, to Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the earth. We find Acts chapter 8 and the Samaritans and the Ethiopian eunuch. We move to Acts chapter 10. We find the Gentiles, the Roman oppressors, now hearing the gospel and being saved. Don't miss the point of Acts chapter 2. It is the final complete fulfillment of the Feast of Pentecost. It says so in verse 1. When the day of Pentecost was fully come. This, just like Passover, was fully fulfilled by the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. So the day of Pentecost, Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks, is fully fulfilled with this new work of the Holy Spirit of God. Peter reminds them that it's a direct fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. The Jews knew it was coming, but they had closed their eyes. Their hearts were hardened. They were blinded by their love for the temporal. But Joel chapter 2 prophesied the coming of the Spirit of God, and Peter says so in Acts chapter 2, verses 9 and following. Now on Sunday morning, the Lord willing, as those of you who are here this morning know, we are moving into a part of our study dealing with the new job God has given us since our salvation, whereby we're going to be talking about the spiritual gifts. We did a study on that a number of years ago in prayer meeting, and perhaps some of you remember part of that. We've touched on it on various occasions, but we want to go through and see what gifts were not given after the completion of the canon. There are seven temporary gifts. They were only available while the New Testament was being written. Those are the gifts that the Charismatics focus on today and think that they've got it, but they're deceived. Either it's a manifestation of satanic power, and indeed there is some of that, or it is a manifestation of the flesh, whereby individuals who recognize that they can control others through this are manipulating it and trying to get people involved in it so they can get their money. Or there is psychological problems with individuals who are involved in it, emotional problems. But it is not the Spirit of God who is manifesting through tongues and apostles and prophets and healing and miracles and interpretation of tongues and the gift of knowledge. The gift of knowledge was the ability to receive new special revelation prior to the completion of the canon of Scripture. And then we'll talk about the 15 gifts that God is still giving today. The gift of evangelist and pastor-teacher and teacher 
and governments and ruling and helps and mercies and hospitality and the 15 different things that God still gives to the church so that we might build one another up in the body of Christ. Don't get carried away by charismania. Don't think that you are suddenly getting into something special and supernatural by all these, quote, miraculous gifts. You may, in fact, get into something supernatural, but not from God. It will be from Satan. I don't know how to say it any more clearly than that, but we're going to talk about that on Sunday mornings as we move through our new job responsibilities in the body of Christ. So tonight we're looking at resisting the Holy Ghost. Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. The first thing that we notice as we begin looking at this passage tonight is that the Holy Ghost is a divine person. He's not merely a force. He's not merely an idea. He's not an internal motivational factor. The Holy Ghost is a divine person. He is one of the three members of the Trinity. We find that by looking at the various passages, and we only have a chance to look at a few of those tonight, but we look at the passages of Scripture which talk about the Holy Spirit. We discover that the Holy Spirit has all the indicia of personage, that he is a real, personal being, and not merely a force. We see in our passage tonight that he can be resisted by those with whom he is working. We see in Ephesians 4.30 that he can be grieved. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Paul's writing that to believers. Did you know that you as a Christian can grieve the Holy Spirit? Very important. Ephesians chapter 4 is dealing with the body of Christ and with our personal responsibilities within the body of Christ. It's Ephesians 4 where we find discussion of the spiritual gifts given by the Holy Spirit. The first three chapters of Ephesians talk about our position in Christ. That's Ephesians 1, Ephesians 2, and Ephesians 3. What a marvelous privilege it is to be in Christ. Ephesians chapter 4, 5, and 6 deals with our obligations once we are in the body of Christ, our obligations to God, our obligations to one another, and our obligations in the spiritual warfare. That's Ephesians 6. The book of Ephesians deals with how we are to relate one to another in the body of Christ, but also how we are to relate to one another as husbands and wives and parents and children. Ephesians 4, 5, and 6 are practical. Ephesians 1, 2, and 3 are positional. And here we find in the practical section a command. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed under the day of redemption. The Holy Spirit seals us. The Holy Spirit is the one who gives us our eternal security. The Holy Spirit is the one who guarantees that we will never be lost once we have been saved. He has sealed us. A seal shows authority. A seal shows possession. A seal threatens those who would break it without authority. You are sealed by the Holy Spirit of God unto the day of redemption when we are caught up to meet Christ, when our bodies are, are metamorphosized into our resurrection bodies, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. But you can grieve the Spirit of God. How do you grieve the Spirit of God? When you sin? You see, He permanently lives inside of you. If you have truly trusted Christ, it is the Spirit of God who dwells in you. If you think you've trusted Christ but have not, you might be subject to demonic spirits. Be very, very careful. The Holy Spirit seals you unto the day of redemption, and He is holy. And so when you sin, you violate that holiness, that holy presence inside of you. 
The Holy Ghost can also be quenched. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5.19 Quench not the Spirit. Again, we find it in command form. You are told not to do it, which means that therefore it is possible. Quenching is putting something out like a fire. He's not talking about loss of salvation. If you look at the context here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, what you discover is that there are ways in which you are no longer under the control of the Spirit. Verse 18 talks about being filled with the Spirit. You know, you can walk in the flesh in at least two different ways that are extremes, opposite one from another, and whereby you are depending upon yourself rather than the Spirit of God to direct your walk. On the one extreme is the charismatic extreme. You're walking there in the flesh, having a wonderful emotional experience, and having genuine experiences, but not from God. You're quenching the Spirit of God when you do all the funny things that the charismatics do, rolling on the floor, holy laughing, holy barking, all that kind of nonsense. You're quenching the Spirit when you do that. But the other extreme is the one that a church like this is much more likely to fall into, whereby you replace the work of the Spirit with formal legalisms and going through all the formalities of having the precisely right worship service and the right guys walking around up in the front and perhaps wearing robes or lighting candles or sprinkling incense as the Catholics and the Orthodox do, whereby you replace the work of the Spirit in the life of the church with that which is not controlled by the Spirit, it is merely an external show of the flesh. The Holy Ghost is involved in inspiration. The word translated inspiration in 2 Timothy 3.16 is theopneustos. You hear pneustos at the end of that. That's from the same word that the word for the Holy Spirit, pneuma, P-N-U-M-A, pneuma. God breathed. God is the first part of that word. It's a work of the Spirit of God in exhaling the Scriptures. That from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. That was Timothy's knowledge of the Old Testament. The Holy Spirit was involved in the Old Testament as well as in the New Testament inspiration. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. The Holy Spirit is involved in doctrine. For reproof, the Holy Spirit is thus involved in reproof. For correction, the Holy Spirit is thus involved in correction. For instruction in righteousness, the Holy Spirit is involved in instruction for righteousness. These are things that come from the inspired, the Spirit breathed scripture, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished, unto all good works. Did you know that the Holy Spirit is involved in justification? 1 Timothy 3.16, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the Spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Did you know that the Holy Spirit speaks? Matthew 10.20, For it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. The Holy Spirit not only speaks, but he also guides believers. John chapter 16, verse 13. Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He is involved in prophecy. He will show you things to come. Fantastic. You look at the book of Revelation. And we find there the things that were, the things that are, and the things that will be. The Holy Spirit of God is involved in that opening up of the prophetic future, which is yet still future for us. The Holy Ghost is God. He is co-equal with the Father and the Son. We find that in Acts chapter 5, verses 3 and 4. Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? Whilst it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thy heart? Now remember, Satan filled his heart to lie to the Holy Ghost. Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You're held accountable for doing it, even though it was Satan who filled your heart with it. You lied to the Holy Ghost. Who did you really lie to? 
Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. Peter states it clearly. The Holy Spirit is, in fact, God. The Holy Ghost can be sinned against. You can only sin against God, ultimately. Even when David committed sin with Bathsheba in committing adultery, what was his prayer in the Psalms? Against thee, thee only have I sinned. You see, we do, indeed, things that are hurtful to other people, and it is a sin. But ultimately it is a sin because it is a sin against God. The Holy Ghost can be sinned against. Matthew chapter 12, 31 and 32. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. You can sin against and blaspheme the Holy Ghost. Wish we had time to talk about that as you look at the passage, the parallel passage in the Gospel of Mark, you find that what it is, the sin of the, against the Holy Ghost, is when you see Christ do a miracle and say, it wasn't the Spirit of God who did it, it was the devil who did it through Christ. Very dangerous, but that is specifically given to us as the definition of the Holy Ghost in Mark 9. The Holy Ghost strives with man, Genesis 6.3. The Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he is flesh, yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. Very important because the striving against the Holy Ghost is very parallel to the resisting of the Holy Ghost, which Stephen speaks of in his sermon here in Acts chapter 7. In the days before the flood, men were resisting the work of the Holy Spirit. You see, this is immediately prior to the flood. God says, I'm going to give them 120 years more, and then it's over. There comes a point of no return. Israel experienced a point of no return during the days of Manasseh, when God finally said, I'm cutting it off, I'm sending my judgment, you can't get away from it. Even though there was a revival after Manasseh, God still sent his judgment of destruction upon Jerusalem. He sent his judgment of destruction through the flood on the entire world. His spirit will not always strive with man. The Holy Ghost instructs. The Holy Ghost regenerates. The Holy Ghost sanctifies. The Holy Ghost comforts believers. I'll just give you a few of the passages. Many, many passages on this demonstrating the Holy Spirit is a divine person, one of the three members of the Trinity. Albeit, when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, Ye must be born again. Without the Holy Spirit, you have no salvation. You are born by the Spirit of God from above. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. John chapter 14, verse 16 and 17. I will pray the Father, he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him. Now listen to this. For he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. He's prophesying it as a coming event. John 14, 15, and 16. All about what the Holy Spirit is going to do. You will find the fruit of the Spirit, for example, that Paul mentions in Galatians chapter 5, all listed in John 14, 15, and 16 as Jesus is prophesying the coming of the Holy Spirit. We find that he's not only going to be with us, and in the Old Testament he would be with people and on people, but then would go away. But he's going to be in us. And he will never leave us. All of those things happened on the day of Pentecost and thereafter. Great promises. Peter talks about it in 1 Peter 1, 2. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God through the sanctification of the Spirit. It is the sanctification of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one who sets you apart, both positionally and practically, for holy living. And obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Now we move to observation two. 
An awful lot to learn about the Holy Spirit in the Word of God. And here we find that Stephen uses that as the point of his accusation. You have resisted the Holy Spirit of God. You're resisting him just like your fathers did. And that is our second observation, like father, like son. There's a continuation of a spiritual rebellion going all the way back into the wilderness wanderings. And we've already discussed that as we looked at the previous verses here in this passage where they had the tabernacle of Moloch and Remphan, whereby they went through the external ritual motions, but their heart was really following another god who was involved in the most grotesque forms of immorality and murder of babies. He tells them, you're exactly like your fathers in the wilderness who committed those heinous sins while pretending to worship God. Like father, like son, continual spiritual rebellion, going all the way back to the Old Testament wilderness wanderings, you do always resist the Holy Ghost. Corollary to that is obvious, as we have said a moment ago, that the Holy Spirit was at work in conviction of sin, even in the Old Testament. The Holy Spirit was work in the Old Testament, though not precisely in all the new ways that we find following the day of Pentecost. The third observation was the violation of the Abrahamic covenant of circumcision in its spiritual application. Isn't that interesting? Here they were, people going through the motions externally, appearing to follow the law, going through the ritual of circumcision, but we find he tells them that they have been a stiff-necked and uncircumcised people in their heart and in their ears. You're no better than Gentiles, says Stephen. How do you think that would have affected ultra-Orthodox Jews to be told you think you're circumcised but you're not. You've gone through the ritual of the flesh but your ears are uncircumcised that is you do not listen to the word of God. Your heart is uncircumcised that is you do not allow the seed of the word of God to penetrate your heart and bring forth fruit because it is a heart of stone and nothing can grow in stone. No fertilization can take place. You see, both Jeremiah and Ezekiel prophesy the coming day when God would give a new heart of flesh in place of a heart of stone. New birth can take place in the heart of flesh. New birth cannot take place in a heart of stone. The violation of the Abrahamic covenant of circumcision and its spiritual application, and we know that that is the sign of the Abrahamic covenant. We saw that already in the passages, many passages in the Old Testament. It's also stated that way in Acts chapter 7, verse 8. He gave him the covenant of circumcision, and so Abraham begat Isaac and circumcised him the eighth day, and Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat the twelve patriarchs. That's part of Stephen's sermon. You see, he's going back to pick up things that he talked about in the first part of his sermon. He's bringing it now to their attention and saying, Okay, you think you're children of Abraham? You went through the ritual? It was the covenant that God gave to Abraham, the sign of the very covenant of Abraham that you claim to be the heirs of. You're uncircumcised in your hearts and you're uncircumcised in your ears. You're just like the Gentiles. Many years ago, back in the South, it was a great insult for a man to use certain words against another man, calling him the N-word and placing him in that race. People were killed for doing that. Two white men would get in a fight and one would call the other one that name, and the other one, perhaps drunk, would pull out a gun and shoot him dead. Here are Orthodox Jews who consider themselves so much better than all the Gentiles around them. They are God's people. They have God's law. They are following the rituals. To have someone come up and call them 
in essentially the same type of terminology, no, you are dogs. You are Gentile dogs. Do you understand why Stephen does this? Is it because he's mad at them? Is it because he's merely trying to insult them? He's Jewish himself. Why does he use this terminology and insult them? As we preach the word of God, many times there are points whereby it is necessary to say something to bring the audience under conviction of sin. It does bring the audience under conviction of sin. But there are two possible results for bringing an audience under conviction of sin. Number one, it will bring them to the point whereby they understand their own sinfulness and will repent, as we see happening in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. Men and brethren, what must we do to be saved? The other possible result is it will bring a hardening of the heart and a hatred and a violent outburst of anger and maliciousness, as we see in Acts chapter 7. It is precisely the same word of God, but it has one of those two effects. Do you remember Moses in Egypt? We find that Moses declares, Thus saith the Lord, here's what you're supposed to do. Rather interesting in Scripture, we find out about the hardening of Pharaoh's heart. About half the time it tells us Pharaoh hardened his heart. About half the rest of the other times it tells us God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Which is it? It's exactly the same word that comes to Pharaoh, but all that the word does is it shows the character of the person upon whom it falls or the, the composition and texture, so to speak, of the modeling clay. If it is clay and it is subjected to heat and pressure, it becomes hard. If it is gold or silver and it is subjected to heat and pressure, it becomes molten and malleable. Same heat, same pressure, different composition of the matter subjected to the heat and pressure. We find in Acts chapter 2, these are righteous Jews coming from at least 18 different language groups who hear the word of God and they are those who have wanted to obey the word of God and the commandment that on these three high feasts of the year every male age 20 and over is supposed to show up, up at Jerusalem to worship the Lord. These are men who from the heart have obeyed the light that they had. And when they hear the word of God it convicts them of sin and they are brought to further light. But like Pharaoh the one in charge, the one who is the ruler. Here's the Sanhedrin. And when they are exposed for who they are and what they are, when the heat is applied to them and the pressure is applied to them, they become hard. They harden their own hearts, but God applying the pressure is also hardening their hearts to show precisely what is in their hearts. So he does with us today. When you hear the word of God proclaimed, you will respond either as did the men of Acts chapter 2, or you will respond as did the Sadducees and the Sanhedrin and the Pharisees in Acts chapter 7. We find the next observation, the fourth observation, is that they had consistently rejected the prophetic word of God and the messengers of God. Which of the prophets have they not persecuted? You know, God was very, very patient with Israel. In the wilderness wanderings, they murmured against him ten times before he finally judged them and said, you're going to die in the wilderness and I'll let your children go in and inherit the land. But then we find that he consistently, throughout the entire history of Israel, sent them prophets who prophesied to them and they persecuted the prophets. He says something else very interesting too. And you've killed the ones who prophesied of the coming of the just one. That is, those prophets who specifically focused on the coming of the Messiah, those are the prophets you killed. Did you get that when you read through the text? 
There's a persecution of all the prophets. But there is a specific, deliberate attempt to kill all the prophets who prophesied the coming of the Messiah. Of course, Satan is behind that. Satan didn't want them to know the great promises of God. Satan doesn't want you to know the great promises of God. You know, our Lord Jesus Christ spoke of these two things in the parable of the vineyard. In Matthew 21, verses 34 through 46, Jesus says, Hear another parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and hedged it round about and digged a wine press in it and built a tower and let it out to husbandmen and went into a far country. Now notice it's the householder who did all the work. Same thing is true with God who made all of creation. Same thing is true of God who, who cut the covenant with Abraham. And when the time of the fruit drew near, do you remember Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem and he goes on the way back and sees the fig tree, looks for figs and there are no fruit and curses the fig tree. And it withers up and dies. And the disciples are astounded. They say, look how quickly the fig tree withered up. You've heard me preach on that, so I'll not detail it, but... Jesus is talking about the nation of Israel, the judgment that's going to come. Because they had arrived at the time when fruit should have been on the fig tree, and it was not there. Jesus came to Israel to collect the fruit. It appeared with leaves to be quite a healthy tree. They even welcomed him on Palm Sunday, but within a week they rejected him. The vine and the fig tree in scripture speak typologically of national Israel. When the time of fruit drew near, he sent his servants unto the husbandmen that they might receive the fruit of it. And the husbandmen took his servants and beat one and killed another and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants more than the first. God sending his prophets over these long periods of time to Israel. And some they beat and some they kill and some they drive out. And they did unto them likewise, but last of all he sent unto them his son, saying, They will reverence my son. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize on his inheritance. And they caught him and cast him out of the vineyard and slew him. Christ was crucified outside the city walls of Jerusalem. When the Lord therefore of the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto those wicked husbandmen? They didn't get it, even though it should have been obvious to them on the surface as he taught it. But they answered, they said unto him, He will miserably destroy those wicked men, and will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits in their seasons. Jesus says, all right guys, you got it? The trap has been sprung, you're inside, now let me remind you what the Bible says. Jesus saith unto them, did you never read the scriptures? <laughs> what an indictment. If you know anything about the Jewish people, the Orthodox Jews, especially the men, spend enormous time reading the scriptures, and they read it out loud, and they follow along with a little special pointer so that they don't accidentally touch the name of God, a little silver hand on a stick as they follow along in the text, except they go from this way to this way, right to left. And they're wearing their prayer shawls and they're wearing a little box on their head and the things wrapped around their wrists and they sit there for hours with other men in the synagogue reading the scriptures. Jesus says to them, did you never read the scriptures? You can only read the scriptures with understanding when you have the illuminating work of the Holy Spirit of God working to give you insight into what God has said. Did you never read the scriptures? The stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our eyes. Psalm 118, he's quoting prophetic scripture. It is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, say I unto you, here I'm going to apply the Bible to you. The kingdom of God shall be taken from you. You, fellas, were the husbandmen that God himself put into his vineyard. 
The kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. Do you think that was offensive when he said that to them? You who think yourself so high and mighty because you are the ones who are physically descended from Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and his twelve sons. To, all of, to you was given all of this. But you rejected God's prophets. You persecuted them, you killed some of them, the ones especially who prophesied of the coming of the Messiah. So it's going to be taken from you. It's going to be given to a nation. Oh, they didn't like to hear that. Given to the Gentiles? To non-Jews? No, no, we can't, re we, we can't accept that, Jesus. They're beginning to understand now. Jesus is opening their eyes. A nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken. Ah, oh, come to Christ. Fall on him. Let him break you. For on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. Judgment. And when the chief priests and Pharisees had heard his parables, they perceived that he spake of them. But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitude because they took him for a prophet. The consistent rejection, that's our fourth observation of the prophetic word of God and the messengers, is the same that was in the hearts of those who sat to judge Stephen. The fifth observation is the consistent murder of those who prophesied the coming of Messiah by actually slaying the Messiah when he came. Stephen understands what the consequences of this might be. Those who point to Jesus may have to face death. Those who point to Jesus may have to face death. It's happening today in our world, people. It doesn't happen here in the United States, at least not openly, though it has happened secretly, where those who have been effective for Christ have been killed. You should read some things like 50 Years in the Church of Rome by Charles Chinnicky, former Roman Catholic priest. Many things are out there that demonstrate that it is still going on surreptitiously. The consistent murder of those who prophesied the coming Messiah by actually slaying the Messiah when he came, and now they are about to slay the one who has pointed out that they are the guilty party. Sixth observation, and we're running out of time. As the trustees of the Mosaic Law, they have been the principal violators of the law. They've been given the law by the disposition of angels and had not kept it. They were the trustees of what God had entrusted to them. Do you know that you are trustees also, all of you who have trusted Christ? You are trustees of the gospel of Christ. What are you doing with the trust that God has committed to you? All of you understand what a trust is. All of you know that a trustee is responsible for administering a trust in the way in which the one who originated the trust designed it to be administrated. Every one of you who have trusted Christ as your Savior are put in trust with the gospel of Christ. We talked about it this morning. What are you doing to serve God with what God has entrusted? There's that word again, trust. With what God has entrusted to you. The incredible, life-changing truth of the gospel of Christ. As trustees of the Mosaic Law, they had been the principal violators of the law. Suppose you were made the trustee for a child. His parents have died and you have become a trustee over certain portions of the estate to make sure that those portions of the estate are multiplied and then that the estate, when the child reaches the age of majority, is placed in his hands, perhaps a part at a time, but perhaps all at once. 
And your responsibility is to administer the trust for the benefit of the beneficiary. But instead, you take the trust and you do multiply it, but you pay yourself all of the interest on the trust. And then you begin to dip into the principle of the trust. So when it comes time for the distribu distribution of the trust, there is perhaps $10 left in what had been a multi-million dollar trust, or perhaps nothing at all. But maybe you've kept in just a little bit so that you can ease your conscience that you've done what you're supposed to do. And you give it that small remainder to the one who is supposed to be the beneficiary. People, you and I have been given a trust far greater than any human trust that has ever been provided for someone who ultimately would inherit that trust. We have been entrusted with the scriptures. We have been entrusted with the gospel of Christ. We have been entrusted with assignments from God concerning how we are to live so that others might see Jesus Christ in us and might benefit from that by seeing a consistent life that matches up with the word which we speak. Someday we will have to stand and give an account of our trust. The Jews were the trustees of the Mosaic Law, but they, and in particular their leaders, had been the principal violators of the Mosaic Law. The seventh and final observation is that they had received the law through the mediation of angels, not merely through the mediation of Moses. God had used divine messengers on Mount Sinai, as Stephen tells us here, and we have talked about that in the past, the angelic work that was involved in the giving of the law at Mount Sinai. Because you see, it was the Shekinah glory of God that descended upon the mountain. And we find from Psalm 68 that the Shekinah glory of God is composed of myriads of holy angels. The Lord is among them as at Mount Sinai, Psalm 68 tells us. Stephen makes reference to that here. Stephen knows the psalm. Stephen knows what David has said. Stephen understands about the seraphim, the burning ones. We call them seraphim. The holy angels of God that surround the throne of God and that are there present wherever God is present. They had received the law from the supernatural realm and it is angels that watch us day by day. There are angels here present in this auditorium tonight watching us, observing our worship learning things about the great creator through the way in which we worship God. People, we have been entrusted with more than Israel was ever entrusted with in the covenant of Sinai. We have not come to Mount Sinai, but unto Mount Zion and to an innumerable company of angels. The book of Hebrews speaks of the better things that you and I have as a result of our new relationship to Christ as his bride and as his body. We haven't come to Mount Sinai and the innumerable company of angels there. We've come to Mount Zion and the innumerable company of angels in heaven. What are we doing with our trust? We have been given a sacred trust. Are we treating it as the Jews did and treating it in such a way that we will come under the chastening hand of God as Stephen is here proclaiming to the Jewish leaders would happen to national Israel? I pray not. But we are living in a time and in an age whereby if we are not faithful in our witness, very soon our light will be engulfed in darkness. I believe that persecution is coming here in the United States. We've been resting on the laurels of our heritage. We've been resting on 
the men of the past who were men of faith and who took stands for righteousness and who lived it and who preached it and who were not ashamed of the gospel. But we see the darkness is increasing around us. You have been made a trustee of the word of God. You have been made a trustee of the gospel of Christ. What will you do with the trust that God has committed to you? Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for the working of your Holy Spirit. How we thank you for your word which he illumines, which he inspired in the first place. Which he breathed out, exhaled through the prophets. How we thank you, Father, that as we study your word, he gives us understanding. And he gives us application, though sometimes it is painful. We thank you, Father, for the courage of Stephen. For his boldness, for the precise logic of his argument as he traces the history of Israel and all the blessings that God had given to them and the hardening of their hearts to reject the only one who could give them life. Father, we pray that you will give us softened hearts, hearts of flesh, not of stone, to hear your word, to believe your word, to apply your word, not merely to others, but to ourselves. Father, we thank you for your Holy Spirit, for his movement among us tonight, for the permanent gifts of service that he has provided so that we might serve you in faithfulness and in joy all the days of our life and this service to our generation. Father, in the quietness of our hearts at this moment, we pray that you will bring to mind any sin that needs to be confessed. Not merely the physical sins, but sins of attitudes, of bitterness, anger, lust, sloth, avarice and all the other things that go along with that covetous desires for temporal things rather than for spiritual things. Father, forgive us for those things which are not pleasing in your sight. As we confess our sins, we know that you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so we come before you with thanksgiving, knowing that you will cleanse us as we confess. And then that you will empower and motivate us. You have given us the power of your Holy Spirit so that we might boldly and without fear proclaim the good news of salvation through Christ alone. In whose name we pray. Amen.